Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the National Capital Planning Commission's December 2nd, 2021 public meeting. First, Ms. Koster, can you please take the roll call? Certainly. Uh, Commissioners Trueblood? Here. Uh, Commissioner May? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Argo? I'm here. All right. Chair White? Present. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner White? Right? Sorry. <laughs> here. They're right together. Um, <laughs> Commissioner Dixon? Here. Commissioner Chang? And she is not here. And Commissioner Davenport? Here. Thank you. Uh, Marcella Costa, the Executive Director, and Skyler, uh, the General Counsel, and Diane Sullivan, Director of Urban Design and Plan Review, are also in the meeting. Uh, I would ask our tech staff if you could uh, help us get the, the admitting off the screen. That would be very helpful. But you do, uh, Madam Chair, have a quorum. Thank you. Well, noting the presence of a quorum, I'd like to call this meeting to order. Today's meeting is live streamed and will be available in a few days as a video on the NCPC website. If there's no objection, the revised agenda as posted is adopted as the order of business. And now we will play a short video clip of the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, and the and justice for all. Thank you. I would also like to pause for a moment of silence for all of those affected by COVID-19 and all the variants in our nation and around the world. In response to the COVID-19 guidelines on public gatherings, NCPC will conduct its meetings online until circumstances change. I want to share how we will be conducting commission business. Votes by the commission will be conducted by roll call. When commissioners wish to be recognized, they should unmute, turn on their webcams, and request to be recognized. During commission deliberations, I will use a round robin format to ask each commissioner if they have any questions or comments. During deliberations, all commissioners should be on video during that time, unless you are experiencing technical issues. When you wish to put forward a motion, a second or an amendment, please unmute, identify yourself and make the motion. Our next agenda item two is the report of the chair. As many of you may know, I was honored to be designated by President Biden as the commission chair uh, late last month. I look forward to working with all of you on the commission and the staff to build and sustain a livable, resilient capital region and advance the Biden administration's critical priorities around sustainability, equity, and innovation. The work we do here at NCPC is so important and it's a real privilege to serve in this role and to work with such esteemed colleagues. And speaking of esteemed colleagues, I would like to take a moment to recognize Andrew Trueblood for his many contributions to the commission. Andrew recently announced that he was stepping down as the director of the DC Office of Planning. Andrew, we will miss you on the commission, wish you the best in your future endeavors. Um, and I'd like to ask you if you'd like to say a few words since this will be your last official meeting with us. Well, thank you very much uh, for the kind comments. Uh, I just want to say uh, really what an honor it's been to serve uh, on the National Capital Planning Commission and to see uh, all of the really fascinating projects and have some fun and sometimes challenging conversations. <laughs> um, but I, I'll say uh, to, to two groups. Uh, number one, I've really enjoyed working with the fellow commissioners. I think we have such a great chemistry, if that's what it we, well, especially given how it is uh, virtually, it's kind of hard to have that. But I do, I really appreciate everybody's perspective. And I think we are, you know, we, uh, I think of, uh, oftentimes are in alignment and, and make these projects better. And I also just want to thank all of the staff, um, Marcel and Julia and, and everybody else. Uh, 
uh, who who really make the place work uh, and make it easy for us uh, to to weigh in on these meetings. You all do such important and and challenging work, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to miss it. I'm going to miss uh, seeing you all, but. Maybe uh, I'll, maybe I'll be around in another another way in, in the future. So thank you all. It's been such a pleasure, uh, and I look forward to following all your great work moving forward and to weighing in today one final time. Uh, thank you so much. And um, no, we will call on you <laughs> for advice. Um, before um, we proceed, Mr. Costa, would you like to say a few words? Yes, I would. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, on behalf of the entire NCPC staff, I'd like to extend our congratulations to you, Commissioner White, on your designation by President Biden as the new chair of the commission. Uh, we're really excited about the opportunity to work with Chair White in her new capacity as we carry out the administration's goals of equity, sustainability, resilience, and innovation. I'd also like to add my appreciation to Commissioner Trueblood for her service to the commission over the last three years uh, through his leadership. We've enjoyed a very productive and collaborative partnership with Office of Planning that has really benefited local and federal interests. And we wish you all the best in your future endeavors and we hope our paths will cross soon. Uh, this concludes my report. I know there's a written report in your packets and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Does anyone have any questions for Director Acosta? Um, hearing none, thank you so much. Um, and as Commissioner Trueblood put so well, the staff uh, really does uh, make this easy for us in terms of being prepared, understanding the issues and working so collaboratively with all of our colleagues across the capital region and, and also for the improvements to our own process and public engagement, expanding um, the reach of NCPC and making sure that we do have an inclusive and accessible process and listening to the public. So um, I'm really excited about our next year, um, getting ready for our 100th anniversary and continuing the great work of the commission. So thank you, Mr. Acosta. Thank you so much. So before we proceed with the, the rest of the agenda, the commission must nominate and vote on who will serve as vice chair, uh, which is the third agenda item. Um, since I previously served as vice chair, a new vice chair must be elected and that person will also serve on the executive committee. So is there a motion to um, elect a vice chair? Chair White, this is Commissioner Argo. Um, if I may, I would like to nominate Arrington Dixon for that position, the position of vice chair of the National Capital Planning Commission. Thank you. A motion that Arrington Dixon serve as commission vice chair has been moved and seconded. Commissioner Dixon, would you like to say anything before the vote? I don't think we've had a second yet. So I am I so sorry. You are absolutely yes. right. Is there a second for this motion? I, I guess I was a little eager. <laughs> I would be happy to second that motion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the motion <laughs> has been seconded. Um, Mr. Dixon, would you like to say anything before the roll call vote? Uh, just to say thank you for this nomination and for giving me a chance to act as a uh, vice chair uh, and I'll do my best to be here for you, Madam Chair, and the Commission and staff when needed. Thank you so much. Ms. Coster, can you please take the vote by roll call? Certainly. Uh, Commissioner Trueblood? Yes. Commissioner May? Yes. Commissioner Argo? Yes. Chair White? Yes. Commissioner Wright? Commissioner sorry, Wright. sorry, I couldn't find my button. Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, Commissioner Dixon? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Davenport? Yes. Thank you, that was unanimous. Uh, yes, the ayes have it. Thank you for your willingness to serve Vice Chair Dixon. I note that Vice Chair Dixon and Commissioner May will continue to serve on the executive committee with me, and I am very grateful for your leadership. Uh, agenda item four is the report of the executive director, which we've we've already heard. Um, 
Unless Mr. Acosta, you have something to add? No, I no, I don't. OK, agenda item five is the legislative update. Ms. Schuyler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, let me begin by saying um, I think I speak on behalf of the entire staff. We are thrilled with your appointment and we really look forward to working with you as the chair moving forward. Um, other than that, I have no legislative report. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schuyler. I really appreciate those kind words. Um, there are no consent calendar items on this month's agenda, so we will move to the open session agenda item 6A, approval of final site development plans for the Hirshhorn Museum Sculpture Garden revitalization. And we will be hearing from Mr. Webb. Hello. Good afternoon. All right, thank you. So good afternoon, Chair White and members of the commission. The Smithsonian Institution has submitted final site development plans for the Hirshhorn Museum Sculpture Gardens revitalization for your review. The final design presents an opportunity to rehabilitate and revitalize the sculpture garden to expand opportunities for additional museum programming while addressing much needed accessibility and maintenance issues. You will recall at the December 3rd, 2020 meeting, the commission approved the preliminary site development plans for the sculpture garden project, with the exception of changes to the reflecting pool and the inner partition wall. The commission received an information presentation on the project design's evolution at its June 3rd, 2021 meeting. For a final review, the commission focuses on the following. Did the applicant address the comments and recommendations made during the preliminary review? Did the applicant provide requested information? And are there any outstanding issues? Before we move into the presentation, as a reminder, the Sculpture Garden is located at 700 Independence Avenue Southwest on the National Mall and is part of the Hirshhorn Museum Complex. The Hirshhorn Complex is framed by 7th Street to the east, the Mary Livingston Ripley Garden to the west, Independence Avenue on the south, and the National Mall along its northern edge. Jefferson Drive separates the museum building from the garden and is controlled by the National Park Service. The museum and garden are organized around the 8th Street north-south axis, aligning with the National Gallery of Art Sculpture Garden and the National Archives across the National Mall to the north. For this final review, in response to the Commission's prior recommendations, the applicant has submitted revised designs for the reflecting pool and the inner partition wall elements in the garden. The new pool design retains the historic bunch shaft reflecting pool in its original location and dimensions with a new pool to its south. The new design for the inner partition wall retains the wall in its location and historic concrete aggregate material but reduces the wall's height to achieve visibility goals. For today's presentation, I will focus on these key elements as well as the signage package included for the final review. Given the project's goals and background, staff's analysis focuses on visitor access and experience, programming and historic preservation considerations, and the project's consistency with relevant policies included in the comprehensive plan. Staff finds that the applicant has fully engaged partner federal agencies and the Section 106 consulting parties through the evolution of the design process. Eight consulting party meetings were held over the last two and a half years. We would like to thank the engagement of the consulting parties, including the Cultural Landscape Foundation, Doco Momo, and the Committee of 100 as their active participation, providing thoughtful comments and suggestions led to project changes throughout the process, influencing the final design, which is before you today. As I've shared before, the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden has been determined individually eligible for the National Register of Historic Places, while already considered contributing to the National Mall's listing. In the Section 106 consultation process, the Smithsonian evaluated the project's potential adverse effects to the garden's contributing elements from both Gordon Bunshaft's completed 1974 design 
as well as the 1981 alterations by Lester Collins. The Smithsonian included a co uh, comparative analysis of the garden's evolution from Von Schaff's completed design and the later contributions by Collins, focusing on the sunken nature of the garden, spatial organization and the use of walls, the arrangement of garden rooms, views and vistas, and the relationship between the garden and the museum building. As part of this analysis, the Smithsonian assessed the potential effects to the garden's visual and spatial relationships by the proposed design and sought opportunities to avoid or minimize potential adverse effects. In following the guidance of the Comprehensive Plan and the Secretary of the Interior Standards, as well as discussions during the Section 106 consultation process, staff has emphasized the preservation of the contributing elements of the current garden while acknowledging, the, acknowledging that the museum's programming needs may justify certain alterations once other alternatives have been explored. Finally, staff will show in the presentation that overall the applicant has worked to minimize adverse effects, especially with the most recent designs for the reflecting pool and the inner partition wall, and that the proposed changes to the garden improve other important functions of the garden design including greater visibility, accessibility, and programming accommodations. The garden's design has changed substantially over time to continually improve these functions. A Section 106 Memorandum of Agreement has been executed to address agreed upon mitigation measures commensurate with adverse effects resulting from the project. Now let's look more closely at the final design for the reflecting pool element in the garden central gallery. As you may recall from previous presentations, Bunshaft's design included a rectangular reflecting pool on the northern end of the sunken central garden with dimensions that link it to the window and balcony on the north side of the Hirshhorn Museum building. The reflecting pool is a contributing element of Bunshaft's garden design and was retained by Lester Collins in his 1981 work. The concept plan in 2019 included several alternatives for a redesign of the reflecting pool, all of which significantly enlarged the pool element. The Commission's comments in 2019 included a recommendation to explore a pool alternative that retained the historic dimensions of Bunshaft's pool design. In the 106 consultation process, the Smithsonian shared additional pool designs prior to landing on their preferred design they presented in the preliminary review in 2020. At the preliminary review, the pool design retained the historic bun shop reflecting pool in its current location, but with an expanded apron around three sides, plus the new U-shaped pool to the south with an art platform to serve as a flexible programming and exhibition space. The Commission's comments at preliminary included a finding that the design for the proposed treatment of the bun shaft reflecting pool did not visually retain the distinct dimensions of the original pool and that the program need for the expansion was unclear. In addition, the Commission recommended the applicant provide a comprehensive rationale for the programming needs that required the expanded aprons around the bun shaft reflecting pool and study other design alternatives prior to any commission consideration. For the final review, the reflecting pool design has been refined to address preservation concerns and functional needs. The historic Bunshaft reflecting pool footprint is maintained. South of this, the new art platform and smaller tiered U-shaped reflecting pool are configured to support varied performance art configurations Redesign of surrounding seating areas and plantings responds to the reduced pool footprint for a well-proportioned gathering space and overall composition. The revised reflecting pool design clearly separates the original bunch of pool outline from the new pool basin to its south. As such, staff recommends that the commission finds that in response to the commission's comments at the preliminary review, the applicant has proposed a revised design that retains the bun shaft reflecting pool's original location, dimensions, and materiality, and the historic pool will also be heated to ensure a year-round presence of water. The new pool to the south provides flexibility for performances with three tiers that allow for the potential of seating for performances and informal gatherings. The size of the new pool has been decreased in size from preliminary and is approximately the same size of the existing turf panel. 
The new pool element can be drained and used as theater seating to meet the museum's desired programming needs. Therefore, staff recommends that the Commission supports the revised design as it retains the historic contributing feature of Bunshaft's reflecting pool while providing a new separate pool that can accommodate the pro programming needs of the museum, particularly as a theater for outdoor performances. Now I'd like to walk you through the final design for the inner partition wall. During the preliminary review in 2020, the Commission expressed concerns over the proposed treatment of the inner partition wall, shown here circled in green, noting that the inner partition wall is a contributing element to Bunshaft's garden design and which was retained by Collins in his 1981 alterations. As the applicant had proposed to rebuild it in its same location and shorter in height, but with a, uh, and, but with a new material change from its historic concrete aggregate to stacked stone. The Commission's other comments at the preliminary review included findings that the inner partition wall was a central focus of the overall garden and backdrop to the reflecting pool and that the concrete aggregate material directly related to the sculpture garden to the museum building and that the applicant had not demonstrated a strong programmatic rationale for altering this character defining feature. The Commission recommended that the applicant provide a comprehensive rationale of the programming need for the change in material prior to any Commission consideration. For the final review, in response to the Commission's comments, the applicant has submitted a design for the inner partition wall that reconstructs the wall in its historic location with the historic concrete aggregate material, but the wall's height is lowered, so the top elevation is three feet six inches above the finished grade of the LA area to the north. This adjustment provides enhanced accessibility through improved wayfinding, offers direct visual connections to the central gallery and underground tunnel, and enables functional support of the central gallery performances and events. And so staff recommends that the commission supports the updated design for the inner partition wall as it minimizes adverse effects and retains the wall's visual relationship to the other concrete aggregate walls of the garden and the museum building. Now I'll walk you quickly through the signage package intended to improve identification and clarify the relationship between the sculpture garden and the museum. At the north and south garden overlooks, signs are planned to be affixed to the outward face of the perimeter concrete walls. The signage lettering will be 12 inches in bronze to be cohesive with the existing and limited material palette of the campus and consistent with the new signage recently added on the south entry of the museum building. At the new ramped entrances from the north and south, the same signage is integrated into the sliding gates. The Hirshhorn logo mark references the curvature of the museum, creating a visual link to clearly identify the relationship of the sculpture garden to the building. Therefore, staff recommends that the Commission supports the Smithsonian's approach to signage and wayfinding and their preferred alternative for letter heights at 12 inches, as the signage will assist the museum in attaining increased visibility and recognition, particularly to visitors on the National Mall. In conclusion, the applicant has responded to the Commission's comments from previous reviews, and staff recommends that the Commission approves the final to site the, excuse me, the final site development plan for the Hirshhorn Museum Sculpture Gardens revitalization project, finding that the proposed plan is supported by many comprehensive plan policies, including those found in the visitor and commemoration, historic preservation, and parks and open space elements. In addition, staff recommends that the Commission finds that the plan balances historic preservation goals of retaining contributing elements of the garden's design while incorporating new elements to allow the museum to accomplish its mission and project goals, including replacing the existing concrete perimeter walls in kind with concrete aggregate, restoring the original tunnel connection between the museum and the garden, creating new garden rooms defined by lower stack stone walls to accommodate spaces to show interactive art, larger sculpture and other contemporary installations and improving accessibility for all abilities by adding north and south ramps into the garden. As I've already covered the rest of the recommendations, I will now conclude my presentation. 
I would like to introduce Melissa Chu, the director of the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, who is here to convey remark, remarks. And there are also members of the project design team here to help answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Lee, for your introduction and for this comprehensive presentation. And I wish to begin by expressing our appreciation to the NCPC com commissioners and staff, including Chair Beth White, Executive Director Marcella Costa, Diane Sullivan and Lee Webb, who have worked so diligently to oversee planning for this important project to preserve and enhance the extraordinary historical and cultural significance that it represents. Over the last three years, we've led a thorough Section 106 public consultation process that has included eight public presentations and open houses engaging more than 300 consulting parties and attendees, and more than 10 opportunities for public comment on design, development, reports and studies. The Smithsonian Institution is appreciative of the interest and involvement of consulting parties throughout a long consultation process that shaped the design to maintain a greater degree of historic integrity while achieving the project goals. The proposed revitalization has been strengthened by this comprehensive and transparent public process which has emphasized both our mission to engage the broadest possible audiences in the transformative power of art as our National Museum of Modern Art. And it's also honored the museum's architectural heritage. From the project's inception, we've been focused on ensuring that the revitalized sculpture garden will become a local, national and international beacon through mission-driven goals that will transform this under, underappreciated and undervisited location on the National Mall. With only 150,000 visitors today, we anticipate now with this new design, a much greater number of visitors providing free access to art for everyone. One of our many goals was to reestablish the cohesiveness of the Sculpture Garden, Plaza and Museum as a single interconnected campus, reinforcing this connection to the National Mall, which has an annual visitation of 30 million visitors. Another goal is to increase the number of modern masterworks from our collection on view by 50% and respond to the dramatic and ongoing evolution in art making by creating new outdoor galleries for the presentation of performance art, large format sculpture, and site-specific installations. More opportunities for artists to show their work. Another goal is to enhance visitor experience and public engagement through universal accessibility, increased shade, seating, and evaporative cooling. With this new design, it provides a 150% increase in shade for visitors, for example. Another important goal for the project was to replace failing infrastructure and design for resilience and sustainability, particularly to mitigate frequent flooding and climate change. All of the existing concrete walls will need to be replaced because of disease, their disease status. And every time DC rains, we find the sculpture garden flooding and endangering the art on display. Our final goal is to revitalize and build upon the historic framework of the Sculpture Garden, incorporating central elements of Gordon Bunshaft's original design and Lester Collins's later modifications. Hiroshi Sugimoto's design is the third design to add to an evolving site and to artists' needs today. We are pleased to highlight the significant mitigation and minimization measures that are documented in the executed memorandum of agreement with support from the signatories. Notable measures include the development of eight alternatives for the reflecting pool, which led to the design presented today that maintains the 1974 pool dimensions, the original dimensions. 
We also developed three alternatives for the inner partition wall with the proposed reconstruction of the wall in original aggregate concrete and lowered to enhance accessibility and sight lines across the sculpture garden. We are reopening the long closed underground passage to reconnect our campus and will re restore the north entrance to the original 60 foot east west dimension to strengthen our connection again to the National Mall. Enhanced universe, universal accessibility throughout the garden is highlighted by accessible entrances both on the north and south side of the garden so that future visitors in wheelchairs and with other mobility needs will no longer have to traverse the mall and its rocky pathways to enter the garden. And we will deploy a variety of educational materials, resources and features, including expanded scholarship and publications, as well as interpretive signage. This educational outreach will highlight historic elements, our landscape palette inspired by Lester Collins, but adapted for the hot garden microclimate and features that address climate adaptability, such as our comprehensive stormwater management design. To conclude, I wish to also thank my many colleagues from the Smithsonian who are here today as part of our panel and who've worked tirelessly to steward this project. And I'm also very pleased that Kevin Gover, the Smithsonian's Undersecretary for Museums and Culture, is here with us this afternoon and he'll be speaking shortly to provide an update on the new Smithsonian Museums. So thank you again, and we look forward to responding to any comments you might have. Thank you, Director Chu and Mr. Webb. Uh, I understand that Smithsonian representatives and the design team are also with us to answer any questions. Before we start the public testimony, do any commissioners have questions for Ms. Chu, Mr. Webb, or the Smithsonian representatives? Hearing no questions, why don't we turn to the public testimony? We have one person signed up to speak, Mr. Dan Salek, who is chair of the Hirshhorn Board of Trustees. Uh, Mr. Salek, we're pleased to have you here with us today, um, and you have five minutes to provide your testimony. So if you could um, turn on your camera and make sure you have sound, we are eager to hear from you. Great, thank you, Commissioner. Can you hear me? I was unable to join by video, but I'm hoping you can hear me. Oh, yes, audio. of course. Thank you. Great. Um, well, first of all, I I'd like to begin by thanking the Commission for its openness to collaboration during this process, and also for understanding the, the nuanced balance between preservation and artistic vision. And I think we all believe what we've accomplished here today with the final design is the best of both worlds. Hiroshi Sugimoto's vision has stayed true to the intent of the original Bunshaft and Collins ideals, while at the same time making the sculpture garden more accessible for millions of visitors on the National Mall and truly ready for the 21st century. We believe the reimagined sculpture garden will be a magnet for artistic vision and talent, and also a beacon for culture on the National Mall. We're really proud of this multi-year collaboration that has had many internal and external stakeholders, all with a broad range of perspectives. There have been many compromises along the way, and all sides have had openness to new ideas and points of view. Uh, we believe that this project is surely better today because of the public input and also Hiroshi Sugimoto's ability to make changes while keeping his larger vision for the sculpture garden intact. The trustees of the Hirshhorn believe the final design presented today represents a win for Washington, a win for arts and culture around the world, and a win for preservation as well. So we are thankful to the commissioners for all their work in this process and are very pleased the MOU has been signed and the project is on its way to becoming a reality. Thank you very much. And uh, we, we do really appreciate the, the collaboration over this long period of time. Thank you so much, Mr. Salek. I really appreciate your comments. Um, are there any questions from the commissioners for Mr. Salek? 
Um, I, if not, I'd like to keep moving and note that the commission received two letters in support of this project. Uh, one from Elliot Ferguson, the president of Destination DC, and one from Richard Reyes Galavand, and we thank them for their comments. Uh, at this time, I will open it up to the commission for discussion. Um, I will start with Commissioner May and then go in a round robin format using our normal seating order. So to the commissioners, please keep your webcams on during the discussion. And first up will be Commissioner May. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I don't really have that much to say. I, um, but before I even say anything, I just want to say um, my thanks and congratulations to Andrew Trueblood. Um, we're going to miss him, um, but wish him well and look forward to uh, encountering him in some other role somewhere, which I'm sure will happen before too long. <laughs> we won't let him get far. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, all right. So, um, with regard to the uh, the Hirshhorn Sculpture Garden, um, I I really do appreciate the the substantial um, modification that has occurred since we had an information presentation on this during the summer, and many of us visited the site um, to to get a a, uh, uh, a better taste of what was uh, what was anticipated, uh, and I I I frankly. I, I'm 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 surprised by um, how much it has changed in response to the concerns of the commission and the concerns of various consulting parties uh, who were involved in this. I think that the the uh, the changes to the long wall in particular uh, and and sticking with the original material uh, I think uh, makes a whole lot of sense and does a better job of uh, finding that right. Uh, balance between the the uh, interest of preserving um, this uh, this garden as it was uh, designed and and uh, by Bunchef and and uh, modified by Collins. Um, so I I mean I was very pleased to see that um, the reflecting pool. I I'm you know I'm always a little skeptical about drainable reflecting pool approaches, um, uh, but we've done it too and. Jury's still out for us, um, but that being said, it really comes down to you know how well it is built and how well it is maintained. Hopefully, um, it will be excellent on both counts and it will function this uh, as appropriate or as as it, the uh, museum needs it to function. Um, I would also recognize that there are uh, still some parties out there, although I didn't see anything in the testimony we received. Who are, who are not happy with this um, end result. I think it did not go far enough to preserve the existing um, garden. Um, I and I'm sympathetic to those those questions, but it, it is a judgment call. I think we've been into this before, um, in particular with comments made by Commissioner Wright at previous meetings about how subjective these uh, this sort of decision making can be. Um, but I do think that it has. Um, uh, the changes that have been made since we saw it last uh, have been substantial and go a long way to uh, strike the right balance. Um, and it, I will say overall, um, even though we were focused on these particular components of it, overall the project will be a really substantial improvement um, to the sculpture garden and uh, in particular moves like reopening the uh, the connection to the museum itself is hugely important. Um, improving accessibility, although I think more could have been done in that regard, but I, I think it does improve accessibility overall. I think all of these things are, are really substantial improvements uh, and uh, I believe it will be a much better place for uh, having these modifications done. So uh, that's it for me, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner May. Commissioner Argo. <clears throat> Sorry, um, I don't. I think Commissioner May has um, summarized nicely uh, a lot of the things that uh, I was thinking of as well. I remember. Um, I I I wanted to say one more thing also about the collaborative process, which I know um, Director Chu um, has mentioned in her you know in her remarks today 
um, I remember um, uh, late, I think it was late last summer or early last summer getting a, I mean, they reached out personally to the, to the commissioners to see, you know, the, to see what they could do um, and that they were taking everything into consideration that commissioners might have in mind about this design, such an important element of, uh, of the National Mall and particularly of the museum. So I think it probably felt for the people really intensely involved with this project, like an, an interminable process. <laughs> but I think, um, I hope everybody feels like in the end, um, the issues were addressed in, in a way that um, works for uh, the people that have um, substantial concerns about historic design and preservation, but also um, concerns about accessibility and integrating all of those concepts and concerns into something that looks like it's going to be a beautiful um, uh, addition to the uh, to the mall. So I was happy to be part of that process, you know, as a commissioner, and um, really look forward to um, to how it's all going to come together. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Argo. Commissioner Wright. Well, okay. I'm going to um, actually resort to my notes, which I don't usually do because I want to be pretty careful here. I've been misquoted before um, on this project. Um, and I do, I do think it's worth noting again I think some of the problems that have arisen in this very lengthy consultation have been in part because of the juxtaposition of artistic vision and preservation approach, which in my view is a faulty construct. Because again, um, neither, neither amounts to objective fact and is, in, yeah, in, is indeed um, quite subjective. Um, and open to interpretation. And I think a lot of the conversation that has uh, led us to this day lost track of that fundamental idea. Um, so I, and I have thought long and hard about this. Um, and I have arrived at the conclusion that the, the walls that have been, the stack stone walls that have been so controversial, um, really do constitute a modern intervention that will be discernible as such, um, as a departure from the original composition, very much like for those of the, in the audience who are familiar with the very lengthy consultation that we underwent for the CISA headquarters building design at St. Elizabeth's, um, the ravine walk that has been designed by the, um, Olin, um, is a quite modern intervention in a National Historic Landmark campus. It is not yet built, but when you see it, I think it will um, strike a similar chord. It's very obviously and intentionally a modern intervention um, and an appropriate one. And, I, and in this case, I think um, uh, the case has been made and I'm willing to take the Hirshhorn's word for it that the intervention serves programmatic needs. Um, and, and, and I also want to say I do respect the concerns regarding the historic integrity of the, of, um, the site expressed by critics of the design. But, but I don't believe that it's a, monolith, a monolithic preservation issue here. Um, the question is not that the question whether or not the Bunshaft Collins composition will be significant, significantly altered or the character changed in this case seems, I know this is heresy for some people, but to me, it's less important to the question of whether or not the visitor experience of the garden is improved by the proposed changes. And I, I think this is so, having visited the garden on a very hot, sweltering day this summer. Um, I thought a lot about, you know, buildings and landscapes have to change 
um, to continue to be useful. They're not fine art, which must remain static um, as the artist intended because they need not perform a function, nor do they need to adapt to climate, to programming or any other external circumstances. The stack stone walls as proposed in my view, and I was very skeptical about the kind of stack stone, I was very careful to say, the kind of stack stone would be um, critical. And, and if the wrong um, kind was employed, it could be to um, the detriment of the garden. But I think that the mock-ups, we've seen many mock-ups and the, those, the, the stack stone that is proposed is a beautiful um, hue, which is really important um, uh, and may in fact help a lot with, um, if not uh, with psychologically cooling the garden down because it is really hot on a hot summer day. Um, and I think the garden really needs that. And then again, I'm willing to take the Hirshhorn at its word that um, the expansion of the pool serves um, a distinct programmatic need. Therefore, <laughs> since all of the other components, um, which we've discussed at length, the accessibility, the, the um, circulation, all these things, um, that have been resolved and go all and together uh, provide, I think, um, or will provide a, 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 a significant improvement in the visitor's uh, experience of the garden um, and the interplay with the mall. I think the, the lowering, specifically the lowering of the wall was, it was is a key change that will really help um, and invite people in. Um, I believe the composition as a whole warrants our support. Thank you so much. Commissioner Dixon. Uh, I associate myself with the eloquent comments made by my colleagues so far, and I'm very happy for us to go forward. Great example of a real collaborative effort that was uh, conducted. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Davenport. No comments here, but except for the fact that I appreciate the Smithsonian working with us on this. This was my introduction as a relatively new commissioner to how immersive uh, this work on the commission can be, uh, getting to visit the site a couple of times and, and engage in sort of real-time feedback on, on this project that I think resulted in a lot of the changes that have been addressed here. So thank you. Thank you. Throwing you into the deep end, Commissioner Davenport, on your first <laughs> entry here. Uh, Commissioner Trueblood. Uh, thank you. I, I don't have a lot to substantively add, uh, especially Commissioners May uh, and Wright did a, a good job, uh, uh, say, you know, I think explaining um, the, the changes that we're all happy to see. I will note that, um, you know, uh, we, our, our SHPO signed off on the MOA. Uh, and uh, we're happy to do that. Uh, the process maybe wasn't the prettiest to get here, but I think what we what we've what what the Smithsonian has achieved is great. Uh, and I look forward uh, to visiting it and maybe uh, you know taking uh, Commissioner Wright out to the Olive Garden to celebrate afterwards. <laughs> Commissioner Trueblood, that's um, quite an it's invitation. The tabs on you, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I believe that uh, concludes any comments from the commissioners. Um, I, I would also like to add my own comments and express appreciation for everyone involved in this process over the past couple of years. Of course, the Smithsonian and the consulting parties. And as, as others have said, I know the process can seem long and tedious at times, but everyone's thoughtful input has really given the process integrity. And I, as a result, I believe we have a design that will benefit both the Hirshhorn and everyone who uses the space. And I, I really want to um, thank Trustee Salek and Director Chu for their 
steadfastness through the process and also for their willingness to to really listen. And I appreciate Trustee Salek's comments today about having an open mind and accommodating others' points of view, because as uh, Commissioner May and Commissioner Wright and others have said, it's it is um, oftentimes you know subjective. There are some objective criteria, but these are these are really important issues that it takes collaboration to move forward. And um, I'm really proud of the participation of all the consulting parties, everyone um, involved in this, because the the fact that we take time to have this kind of deliberative process and listen to one another is is not something that goes on very often in the world these days, it seems. So um, all of your input led to a greater evaluation of Lester Collins' work, which is important. Replacement of the inner partition wall with in-kind material, replacement of the reflecting pool and its original dimensions, among other things, um, were really, really thought through. And I appreciate the Smithsonian's efforts to preserve the sunken nature of the garden, which makes it so special in my mind, and maintain the space with the galleries to view the art, perhaps even more importantly, the reintroduction of the underground tunnel connection to make it function as one campus, as Director Chu pointed out, which you know, had been lost for many decades. So I'm very happy that the design will attract more people to this very beautiful space. And, you know, I, I want to say adapting landscapes to meet current mission and project goals is challenging. Um, and as we we saw this through the lengthy evolution of the National World War I Memorial, where we faced very similar issues, but it can be done right. And I think that is what this project has achieved, which is really important. The proposed alternative in front of us successfully balances historic preservation with other planning objectives and aesthetic desires. And, you know, all of these things NCPC must consider in our review. I like how the Advisory Council's letter notes that design preferences may vary, and the Section 106 process emphasizes seeking agreement where feasible. I think we have done that here, and I am very pleased with the outcome. So if there are no other um, requests from the commissioners or questions, um, I would call for a motion to approve the final site development plans. Is there a motion? So moved. So moved. Arrington Dixon. I believe that was Commissioner Dixon who moved. Is there a second? I'll second. This is Commissioner right. Argo. Thank you, Commissioner Argo. Ms. Coster, can you please confirm the motion in the second and take the vote by roll call? Certainly. Uh, that was uh, the motion was by Commissioner Dixon. The second was by Commissioner Argo. And with that, Commissioner Trueblood. Yes. Commissioner May. Yes. Commissioner Argo. Yes. Chair White. Yes. Commissioner Wright. Yes. Commissioner Dixon. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Davenport. Abstain. Thank you. The motion has carried. So congratulations, everyone. I look forward to visiting the garden when it's even before it's complete, but especially <laughs> after it's complete. So the next item is agenda item 7A, an information presentation on the new Smithsonian Museum site evaluation study. Mr. Fliss. Thank you, Chair White. Um, good afternoon, Commissioners. Hopefully you can see my screen. Today, the Smithsonian Institution is here to provide an information presentation regarding the site evaluation study that they are undertaking for two new museums, which were uh, authorized by Congress in December of last year. The Smithsonian is going to cover the background and details of this effort, but before we get in, before we get to that component, I, I would just like to provide a little bit of context in terms of uh, how NCPC fits into this process. The two, two new museums include the American Women's History Museum, as well as the National Museum of the American Latino. The Smithsonian Board of Regents must designate those uh, museum sites by December 2022, so about a year from now, um, and as such has the decision-making decision authority. 
The Smithsonian is undertaking a concurrent site evaluation study process to identify sites for both museums. So according to the legislation, the Board of Regents must consult with a number of parties, including the chair of NCPC. As such, NCPC has an advisory role in this process. Uh, this is consistent with the most recent site selection effort for the National Museum of African American History and Culture, uh, which occurred um, some time ago. Generally, this process involves the chair of NCPC issuing a letter to the Smithsonian with recommendations on a preferred site or sites after a consultation. Following site selection by the Board of Regents, NCPC would have approval authority over the site and building plans uh, pursuant to the typical Planning Act authority. Again, this is consistent with the process that was uh, used for the most recent museum. NCPC would also review any storage facilities or other kinds of um, uh, components if in the environs if they were, or were necessary for the new museums. So for today's br briefing um, is the first of three um, you're going to hear from the Smithsonian regarding the site evaluation process. Uh, they will be back with two uh, briefings, uh, one later this winter or perhaps early spring, and then a final one later in the summer of 2022. Um, as the study unfolds, uh, these briefings are going to provide additional details on the proposed program for the museums, uh, site selection criteria, as well as the evaluation of specific sites. Uh, I will mention before I conclude here that as part of this consultation process, the Commission has the opportunity to provide comments and feedback at any point. Um, and of course, staff can work to summarize and transmit those questions and guidance to the Smithsonian as directed. In addition, the Smithsonian is undertaking a broad outreach effort uh, beyond these briefings with a number of other stakeholders, uh, which will they will describe further in their presentation uh, here in a moment. Um, staff, NCPC staff will also be participating in, in that process as well. So with that as context, I'd like to now turn it over to Kevin Gover, uh, who is Undersecretary for Museums and Culture with the Smithsonian Institution, who's going to speak further about this important effort. Thank you, Mr. Fliss, and good afternoon, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioners. Um, last December, Congress passed the, uh, the new museums or created the new museums as part of the uh, budget bill. In, uh, at the end of the year. For those not directly involved in writing that legislation, uh, I'd like to highlight a few key requirements with respect to site selection and the facilities. While each museum has its own enabling legislation, uh, and there are many commonalities between the two, particularly with respect to requirements for the site selection process to be followed by the Smithsonian's regions. For this reason, we're going to pursue the selection of sites for both museums concurrently, though through separately tracked budgets and contracts, and with, with specific outreach to stakeholders for each museum. Key among these requirements, and a difference from the African American Museum, is that a federal entity asked to give up a site under its jurisdiction for a museum must agree to that transfer. The legislation includes criteria to be considered and calls for a DC location on or near the National Mall. As to the National Museum of the American Latino, four specific sites are identified for consideration with the potential to evaluate additional sites as well. The Smithsonian's Arts and Industries Building, the Department of Agriculture's Whitten Building on the Mall, the Capitol site, National Gallery and across the mall from the U.S. Botanic Gardens and the South Monument site directly across the mall from the African American Museum. The, site the building for the National Museum of the American Latino is to be no less than that included in the Presidential Commission report and that's approximately 310,000 square feet for the museum and another 50,000 square feet for collection storage, the latter likely to be off site. The Smithsonian American Women's History Museum, two sites named for specific were, were named for specific consideration, um, and both also named for the consideration for the Latino Museum, the Capitol site and the South Monument site. Now, no size was specified in the Women's History Museum legislation. The Congressional Commission report size was viewed as too small for a national museum. 
So our site study will include identifying an approximate size requirement. So with that, uh, Madam Chair of Commissioners, I'd like to call on Ann Tobridge, the Associate Director for Planning at Smithsonian Facilities. Thank you, Kevin, and good afternoon and congratulations, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, next slide. Planning, designing, and building concurrent museum projects is what we do at the Smithsonian for example, here at the Hazi Center at Dulles and the National Museum of American Indian on the Mall were constructed at approximately the same time. So we are ready to take on the challenge of uh, planning, designing, and constructing two museums. Next slide, please. Our recently completed Museum of African American History and Culture provides both a high bar for achievement for these next two museums, as well as useful lessons learned. Many of our staff who worked on the African American Museum are working on this museum project, including Derek Ross, our director of the Office of Planning, De Design and Construction, who has for decades uh, worked on our museum projects from inception to opening day. Next. Our museum development process will involve these general project phases and our facilities team has estimated rough uh, time durations for completion. Those durations will likely vary depending on the sites selected for each museum. Some phases may overlap. Uh, we will refine this, the schedules as we choose the sites. Uh, next slide, please. I would now like to provide an overview of the current site evaluation study we are conducting. Next slide, please. The project has a tight timeline with just over a year to complete the process. Uh, contracts for the Women's History Museum and the American Latino Museum site evaluation study were signed in August 2021. Uh, we will be conducting an extensive process of evaluating sites that will run through December 22nd and will include set several updates to this commission. Uh, our regents are expected to make a recommendation at their October 2022 meeting. Next. I'd like to uh, provide a brief introduction to our architectural and engineering team, Ayer St. Gross. Uh, they will be working on the site evaluation study. They are not the architects for the eventual museums. Those will be separate uh, architect selection processes in the future. Ayer St. Gross, led by Luann Green, their president is based in Baltimore and DC and includes extensive planning and stakeholder outreach expertise that will provide a basis for the Smithsonian region site selections. Uh, ASG has extensive planning and design experience with the Smithsonian, including the Air and Space Museum's Master Plan, the National Zoo Plan, our SI-wide collections framework plan and current and recent building designs for the museum support center pod six soon to start construction and the completed collection storage module added to the Hazi center several years ago among others next this map indicates the four sites identified in the enabling legislation Two of the sites identified for consideration are common to both museums, the South Monument site under the jurisdiction of the National Park Service and the Capitol site under the jurisdiction of the architect of the Capitol. The other two sites identified for the Latino Museum include the Witten Building occupied by the Department of Agriculture and the Smithsonian's Arts and Industries Building. Next slide, please. This shows a, a list of our starting point for identifying sites. Uh, 
approximately 24 additional sites will be considered that were cumulatively identified by the Presidential and Congressional Commission reports for both the National Museum of American Latino and the Smithsonian American Women's History Museum. Uh, these properties are managed by the GSA, the National Park Service, the Architect of the Capitol, the United States Postal Service, as well as a few private owners. Some of the sites on this long list have been transferred to new owners for development and are no longer available and will soon be eliminated. Those include the South Interior site, now part of the Federal Reserve Bank, the Cotton Annex site, now under private development, and the Spy Museum site at L'Enfant Plaza. We expect to identify a short list of sites for further analysis by early spring 2022. Next, please. Two additional sites uh, for consideration were recommended by the District of Columbia, the uh, former Walter Reed campus and Barry Farm. Other viable sites may be added during this process. Uh, next slide, please. This slide describes our evaluation criteria. Available sites are being evaluated in two phases, usually utilizing progressively more detailed criteria. This slide includes the primary criteria for which sites will be evaluated, as well as some of the detailed elements of each. Not all criteria are of equal significance to the site selection, so weighting will be applied. This, these criteria include criteria that were in specifically included in the legislation, including location on or near the National Mall to the extent practicable. Next slide, please. Diverse stakeholders internal and external to the Smithsonian will be engaged to ensure a comprehensive, objective, and transparent process that leads to a viable site recommendation and to address required consultations included in the enabling legislation for each museum. The legislation requires that the Smithsonian consult with the chair or director of several government agencies and the chair and ranking members of seven House and Senate committees. Although not specifically required by the legislation, the Smithsonian intends to consult with several DC government offices and with Con Congresswoman Norton. Smithsonian Facilities has asked our own Smithsonian Organization and Audience Research Group and consultant Cecilia Garibay to conduct some preliminary audience research to help inform site selection and planning level program development. The team will identify and review audience research from both Smithsonian and external sources and provide a report on the findings and analysis. Ayer St. Gross and its team working together with Smithsonian facilities and the museum's interim directors will conduct focus groups and town halls with a variety of constituent groups to help inform the site evaluations. These uh, have been going on all of this week, including at this very time, and we have received wonderful input to date from, from these virtual focus groups. Next slide, please. The challenges for this project are many. Uh, we have our political challenges, our, our schedule of one year, the, the uh, challenge of finding a site on or near the National Mall, uh, no sites are identified ideal. Many sites have very happy owners who are uh, not necessarily eager to part with them. Uh, we have a short period in which to engage numerous stakeholders uh, in the next eight or nine months. Uh, and of course, we want to make sure that our preconceived preferences and ideas about sites and about what a museum should be uh, do not 
uh, get in the way of this very um, consequential decision for each museum. Finally, as usual, we have the challenge of funding two museums and their development at one time. This um, this uh, funding will be a split of 50-50 between the public and uh, private sources donations. Uh, with that, next slide. Uh, we invite your comments and questions. My colleagues, uh, Nancy Bechtel, uh, Director of Smithsonian Facilities, Kevin Gover, our Undersecretary for Museums and Culture, and Stephanie Felton, our new Deputy Director for Planning and Program Manager, are here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Ms. Trowbridge, for that presentation. It's really fascinating all of the things you have to consider in this site selection process. And thank you, Mr. Gover, Mr. Fliss. Uh, commissioners, do you have any general questions for the staff or the Smithsonian representatives at this time? Is this just questions or comments? Um, just questions now, and then we can open it up for discussion. Okay, no questions. No questions? Okay, well, thank you very much, Ms. Trowbridge. I will now open it up to the commission for discussion. I will start with Commissioner Trueblood and then go in a round robin format again. Please keep your webcams on during the discussion. Commissioner Trueblood. Thank you, uh, and, and thanks for the presentation. You have uh, quite the challenge in front of you, uh, as you point out. Uh, Lots of constraints, um, you know, uh, the lots of constraints and, and challenges and short timelines. So uh, we look forward to working with you on all of it. I guess uh, really just two things. I don't, I don't really don't know what value I have to add at this moment, um, although I'm interested in the conversation. I almost want to pass my comments to see what other people say. Um, but kind of putting on the lens of uh, the District of Columbia and how we look at it. So, I mean, obviously, Maybe before I put the lens of District of Columbia, let's put federal lens. I can think of no better place for a museum of women than on the mall. You know, I know we're running out of space, but what better uh, space for uh, at least half of our country uh, museum than than on the mall? And and certainly these are both both museums are are critically important and 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 I think raised to the level of something that you know should be considered for the the very few spaces as you show that are left on the mall. So. That's my big comment. My, my, my other comment is really um, just making sure that you all think, or, 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 and you had there, but really that forest stall building and, and Commissioner Wright may be like, you know, hitting me uh, virtually to say this, but um, yeah, the forest stall building is a real opportunity to me for a few reasons. Um, I think it's a chance to really begin to move the mall along to 10th Street Southwest towards the Spy Museum and the Wharf and really engage that area as the Eco District Plan um, tries to begin doing. Uh, I think it could also remedy some of the historic challenges of that Forestall building itself, which um, uh, obviously creates challenges around view sheds. Um, so I just think it could have a great economic development impact uh, if one or both were, were considered for that for one of those sites. Um, and um, could also be basically extend what the mall is. So rather than saying taking up much limited space on the mall, we actually can start to change or grow the mall itself. So um, I think that that's something that I would just I would really strongly encourage you to look at and, and offer our support in however uh, we can uh, to, to if, if there are things that we can do to further that. And I think that's all I've got. Thank you. Commissioner May. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I uh, agree in particular with uh, Commissioner Trueblood's comments about the potential of the forest building and opportunities to extend the mall. Uh, I think that those are, are really good uh, suggestions and of course things that we talked about in, in the past at NCPC. Um, I just want to say I welcome the start of this process. It's been on our minds uh, since the legislation was passed. And uh, I look forward to it getting started. I really appreciate the presentation that we received that outlines things. And uh, I would note that it is a very complicated path uh, to get to site selection. Uh, and then, of course, uh, funding, construction, all of those um, great challenges. 
So, uh, I mean, we're we deal with citing memorials all the time, which can be incredibly complicated, but they're obviously on a much smaller scale. So it's not nearly the challenge I think that, that establishing a new museum can be. Um, I would note also that in addition to the NCPC consultation that occurred, and this was in the presentation as well, but there will be consultation with others, uh, including uh, National Capital Memorial Advisory Commission, uh, the chairman most explicitly, but the, the Smithsonian has agreed to, to present to the Memorial Advisory Commission, and of course to the um, uh, director of the National Park Service. Um, and uh, I just want to express my appreciation for the outreach that has already happened. Um, the fo focus groups that are ongoing right now, um, literally, uh, and uh, also the outreach that has occurred already um, between uh, the secretary of the Smithsonian and uh, the Secretary of the Interior, and of course, the outreach directly to my office uh, because of our role in citing new things uh, on the, on the uh, in, in Washington generally and uh, the process that we go through. So we really do appreciate all the outreach that's happened. And uh, it's a little bit breathtaking to consider that all this has to be done and wrapped up uh, in about a year, but um, we'll do everything we can to help uh, move things along. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner May. Commissioner Argo. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Commissioner White, Chair White. Um, I would just like to, I have to say I'm really excited about um, about the process starting for both, muse both of these museums in particular, um, uh, the National Museum of the American Woman. And um, uh, I'd like to associate my comments. Uh, I'd like to associate with the comments made by both the previous commissioners, um, particular Commissioner uh, Trueblood, and nothing else at this time. Um, it's just a really, uh, it's great. It's, uh, I, I'm excited that, that the process is beginning. Thank you. Commissioner Wright. I don't have any comments or questions. I'm, <laughs> there are a lot of GSA buildings on the list where we're, um, I'm intimately familiar with it. Great, thank you. Commissioner Dixon. Uh, just uh, my uh, appreciation for the complication of this and having been through this on other uh, sightings with the commission, that's complicated. So good luck and uh, I'm sure you'll do, uh, it'll be tough, but a good job. Thank you, Commissioner Davenport. No comments at this time. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for the thoughtful comments and the informative presentation. Certainly the prospect of these two museums is very exciting for all of us and I'm looking forward to seeing the site evaluation study in the future. And you know, while not considered traditional memorials and monuments, these museums truly commemorate people, events, our culture that are part and parcel of the tapestry of our nation. So you you have a big task before you. And I, I just want to share um, my perspective on this. And I want to preface my comments by saying that, you know, I've strongly advocated for parks and open space for most of my career, particularly my work at Friends of the Chicago River, the Trust for Public Land, and now at Houston Parks Board. And like my colleagues at the National Park Service, I understand the value of protecting open space now more than ever as development pressures increase and appreciate uh, their position as stewards of our national park lands. And in recent years, you know, National Capital Planning Commission has put considerable effort into identifying and promoting new locations for the next generation of museums and memorials throughout all of Washington, D.C. to preserve the National Mall and create new symbolic destinations. Um, but I, I just wanna say as the at-large commissioner, um, I, I consider the future purpose of the National Mall, which has evolved over time. And the more significant questions we need to be asking ourselves about equity and representation, uh, since it is a place where we commemorate as a nation. And it, it is a, um, is it a, a truly substantially completed work of civic art? Um, it's a unique and symbolic national park. And as uh, Commissioner Trueblood said, not only we, we preserve um, and 
and celebrate what's there and people wanting to be on the mall, but how do we expand it uh, even further? So issues of equity and inclusion you know, were not explicitly addressed in the 2001 Mu Memorials and Museums Master Plan and its resulting policy. So I want us to be sure that that's at the forefront of our minds as we um, work through the process. And we all know that the combination of national museums, memorials, and monuments in and around the mall represent important groups and individuals. However, we also must acknowledge that the story is incomplete and it doesn't include many of the communities, identities, races, ethnicities, backgrounds, abilities, cultures, and beliefs of the American people. And we heard about this during last month's Beyond Granite presentation that included the recent National Monument audit findings. So this discussion about these two new museums is quite timely and also certainly relevant given the Biden administration's focus on equity, inclusion, and representation. The National Museum of Women's History and the National Museum of the American Latino both reflect populations that are significantly underrepresented in the commemorative landscape. And Congress has directed the Smithsonian to consider the South Mall site on the National Mall as one option for either museum. So I just wanted to share that I really believe the matter deserves to be thoroughly considered throughout the site selection process, um, you know, not categorically or prematurely ruled out as with any site. And I just um, wanted to let you know I will work to you know be objective and um, open minded and thoughtful about this process as we look forward to future discussions as the Smithsonian returns with their findings. So with that, thank you again for the thoughtful presentation and um, thank you for being here. So our, our next, our next uh, agenda item is 6B and it is for the approval of comments on the concept plans for the first division monument modifications. Mr. Fliss. Thank you. Um, I hopefully you can see my presentation. Um, yes. As you, as you mentioned, this is a, a submission by the National Park Service in partnership with the Society of the First Infantry Division, uh, a submission of concept plans for proposed modifications to the First Division Monument, which is located in President's Park here in downtown Washington, D.C. The changes to the monument were authorized by Congress to honor those in the First Infantry Division who sacrificed their lives um, in Operation Desert Storm, Operations Iraqi Freedom and New Dawn, and Operation Enduring Freedom. So this proposal is an expansion of an existing memorial. So the focus of this concept review is on the elements of the proposed uh, project, the program, and to provide direction or guidance as to the best approach. So just a reminder and a quick, quick refresher in terms of where we are in the memorial uh, process. Um, this is uh, at the beginning of the review for what is a modification to an existing memorial. So we've skipped ahead in terms of site selection to uh, design development. At this point, the National Capital Memorial Advisory Commission and the U.S. Commission of Fine Arts have both reviewed the proposed design and provided their feedback. Uh, Nick Mack, uh, the uh, Memorial Advisory Commission, has an advisory role, while CFA and NCPC have approval authority over the design. So moving on to the proposal, the monument, uh, the existing monument is located within President's Park, just south of the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, highlighted here in yellow, and just east of 17th Street Northwest. Here I'm just zooming in a little bit closer. You can see the monument site here. The White House is located just to the northeast. And then zooming in even further, you can see the entire uh, monument, uh, which is comprised of several components which have been added over time. The center includes the original War World War I uh, monument. The west side is uh, a portion dedicated to World War II, while the east side includes the Vietnam War component, as well as a small plaque to, to um, Operation Desert Storm. The accessible entrance to the monument is from the north, and there are a series of ceremonial steps from the south. So here's just a, a few views. This is looking to the north. You can see the Eisenhower Executive Office building in the background, and then the World War I column and, and um, the Angel are the kind of most prominent uh, pieces of this. 
So the the golem, the the column and the gold statue, uh, as I mentioned, are the World War One component. Um, these were completed in the 1920s. This portion, like the others that I'll show you, include individual names of the first division members who gave their lives uh, for for this and and future uh, military campaigns. The site, as I mentioned, was then expanded to the west for World War One. Um, this was dedicated in 1957. The Vietnam War component was dedicated in 1977, and you can see for each of these the low stone walls with bronze plaques on top. Again, these include the individual service members for each uh, military campaign. I point this out uh, because it's important uh, as this is the uh, design approach that the um, applicant is proposing for the, the modest modifications uh, proposed for these additional um, operations. Here, uh, just uh, finally, is the op existing Operation Desert Storm plaque. Um, this one's a little bit different because it's actually ground mounted on, a, on a, again, a piece of stone, uh, not on those plinths. Um, uh, this will be uh, relocated and incorporated into the modifications that I'm about to show you. So as I mentioned, the 1st Inf Infantry Division received authorization to make modifications to the monument to honor those in the division who sacrificed their lives for uh, Operation Desert Storm, Iraqi Freedom, uh, and New Dawn, as well as Enduring Freedom. To accomplish this, the applicant is proposing the addition of three stone plinths uh, highlighted here. These would be approximately 10 foot long each and about 32 inches tall, uh, constructed on the north side of this planting and, and uh, walkway area. Each plinth would uh, include a cast uh, bronze plaque with the, with the names of uh, military members. Again, the overall memorial is not changing. The footprint is not changing. So here's just a perspective view, a sketch showing those new those uh, stone plants that would be added. The desert storm plaque would be removed and incorporated. And here you can see the existing um, monument. This is the Vietnam War component. Again, the design is is reflective of that and 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 um, you know, utilized for this uh, modification. Here's just another view. Um, again, you can see the Vietnam War component. This is the new addition here. Uh, this is uh, just a further sketch showing the specific uh, plaques uh, on each plinth to kind of give you some sense of where these uh, military campaigns are going to be reflected. And then finally, I'll note that the proposed design um, could also be mirrored on the west side of the monument. Um, this is uh, this uh, monument is is relatively symmetrical um, in plan. Um, so this is not part of the current proposal, but just to show that if additional space was necessary in the future, that uh, these plants could be reflected here and, and again preserve the overall symmetry of the monument. And then lastly, here's an example of the, the proposed design for the plaques, again consistent with the existing monument. Um, so just as I wrap up here, I just want to mention again, this monument has expanded over time uh, with additional commemorative components. Um, and staff does recommend the commission find that the proposed modifications are consistent with the history of the monument and reflect the established design vocabulary uh, of those granite plants with bronze plaques. Um, and then finally, I just want to note that President's Park is often closed to public access um, at the request of the United States Secret Service. Obviously, it's very close to um, the executive office building in the White House. Um, however, these closures can restrict access to the monument, as shown in this uh, recent picture from a, a few weeks ago. Um, this does create challenges for those who might want to visit the monument or commemorate their loved ones. And as such, we do recommend the Commission encourage the Park Service as well as the United States Secret Service to continue coordination and exploring strategies to help ensure public access to this monument while, uh, while still considering the security needs for President's Park as well as the White House complex. So overall staff finds the applicant's preferred approach is appropriate and sensitive to the history and design of the existing monument. I've already gone through the rest of the recommendations in my presentation, so I will, um, in the interest of time, not repeat them. I'm happy to answer any questions. We also have representatives from the design team as well as the National Park Service here to help answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Bliss. And I appreciate that um, General Thomas Rain is also available to answer any questions representing the Society for First Infantry. So with that, um, fellow commissioners, are there any questions for Mr. Fliss?
or um, okay, so hearing no questions, I'll now open it up for discussion. I will start with Commissioner Dixon and then go in a round robin format. So please keep your webcams on during the discussion. Commissioner Dixon. I'm fine. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Commissioner Dixon. Commissioner Davenport. I'm good as well. Thank you, Commissioner Trueblood. No comments from me. Thanks for the presentation. Commissioner May. Uh, I would just say thank you for the presentation as well and note that when it comes to access to the site uh, and our discussions with the Secret Service, we devote a lot of time to that topic as we do to other issues of balancing the security needs of the Secret Service and uh, the Park Service's uh, mission to provide um, these park spaces to the public. So um, I, I note that concern. Uh, maybe somebody from the Secret Service is watching and will hear this as well, but uh, believe me, we spend a lot of time on this. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner Argo. I have uh, no further comments at this point. It, um, that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Wright. I don't either. It's a very straightforward project, um, you know, I, and 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 thoughtful leaves room for. Oh, gosh, I'm trying to think of the name of the one that's over on the ellipse. It's very similar in approach and trying to anticipate um, change, and that's always good. Second division, second division. Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. I don't know Thank my you. divisions. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, I, I would just like to thank uh, General Rame specifically for the work with the Society for First Infantry. Um, my grandfather fought in World War I. Um, I didn't really get to know him, but he is legendary in my family, along with so many of the other veterans who have fought in these wars. And I appreciate your devotion to this and to the thoughtful um, sort of updating of that site and keeping it fresh. And thank you, Commissioner May, for speaking to the accessibility issues. It's a it's a tough balance there, but um, good to, to hear you are on the case as always to try to balance security with access. I think that's really important. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, so with that, um, we would like to have Ms. Coster. Let's see, we need a motion first. Sorry about that. Is there a motion to approve the comments on the concept plans? Would you like to make a motion? So moved. Second. And Commissioner Argo, um, I heard a second. Second. Mr. May seconds. Ms. Coster, can you please confirm the motion in the second and take the vote by roll call? Certainly. Uh, the motion was made by Commissioner Argo and the second by Commissioner May. With that, uh, Commissioner Trueblood? Yes. Uh, I'm checking. I think Commissioner McMahon has joined the meeting. Um, yes, I am here and uh, I say yes. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner May? Yes. Commissioner Argo? Yes. Chair White? Yes. Commissioner Wright? Yes. Commissioner Dixon? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Davenport? Abstain. Okay, and double checking to see if Commissioner Chang is with us in the meeting. All right. Uh, Thank you. The motion has carried. Next is an item, agenda item 6C, sorry about that, is for approval of comments on site selection for the Texas Legation Memorial. Ms. Hare. Yes, thank you. Can you see my slides? Yes. Great. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Madam Chair, congratulations, and members of the Commission. The National Park Service, in collaboration with the Daughters of the Republic of Texas, has submitted a site selection study 
for the Texas Legation Memorial to the Commission for review and comment. Just a qu couple of quick refreshers on memorials and where we are right now in this commemorative process. This is the beginning of the review for this memorial, so we are right here at site selection. At this point, the National Capital Memorial Advisory Commission and the U.S. Commission of Fine Arts review the site selection study and provide their feedback. Nick Mack has an advisory role over commemorative works where CFA and NCPC have approval authority on site and design. The commission is weighing the challenges and opportunities of each site. After these comments, the applicant will develop designs within the preferred site or sites. <clears throat> A quick reminder of the required criteria outlined in the Commemorative Works Act for site and design approval. This includes locating the work in surroundings that are relevant to the subject and in a location that does not interfere with an existing work. The location should also protect open space and existing public use, as well as cultural and natural resources. And with that, I'll go to the submission. In 2020, under Public Law 116-248, Congress authorized the Daughters of the Republic of Texas to build a commemorative work in Washington, D.C. to commemorate and honor those who, as representatives of the Republic of Texas, served in the District of Columbia as diplomats to the United States and made possible the annexation of Texas as the 28th state. The submission from the National Park Service and the Daughters of the Republic of Texas included information regarding the memorial program, such as uh, it being a modest memorial near one of eight sites in Washington, D.C., where diplomatic ministers from the Republic of Texas lived when in town on diplomatic business. Moving forward in this commemorative process, the Commission will need to know the approximate size and scale of the memorial and anticipated elements, such as sculpture or landscaping, and what the tone of the memorial might be, and whether it is somber, celebratory, or otherwise. The applicant has submitted a handful of existing plaques and small memorials, noted here as examples of the scale of a future memorial. The submission includes the specific site selection evaluation criteria. The primary focus for a memorial site is proximity to one or several of the original boarding house sites where the Republic of Texas legation to Washington lived and worked. The remaining criteria are typical for memorials in Washington, D.C. Although none of the original boarding houses still exist, their locations and importance has been thoroughly documented through historical research. These are the eight boarding house locations that the site selection focused on initially and extend from New Jersey Avenue Southeast to Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest. The applicant identified 13 sites for assessment labeled A through M on this map. The red dots indicate the original boarding house locations. In order to assess each location, the applicant used the following site evalu evaluation criteria to narrow possible memorial locations. In the District of Columbia or its environs, thematically connected to the memorial via proximity to one or more sites associated with the Texas legation and or the Republic of Texas, easily located and accessed by pedestrians, accessible via public transportation and parking, able to meet universal accessibility standards, able to be as peaceful and free from distraction as possible, able to provide shade as a respite from the heat, including from trees or adjacent buildings, with minimal required changes to roads and or utilities, and lastly, availability and without known opposition to the placement of a memorial. The applicant analyzed each of the sites using the criteria and narrowed the list to three sites, site E and F, with site F being split into options one and two. Now I'll walk through the evaluation and details of each of these three sites. This map shows the final three sites and their proximity to five boarding house locations. All three sites are within area two. Next, I will review specific details of each site. Site E is located at the north end of the plaza between the Market Square buildings, directly north of the Navy Memorial. The site is close to five of the original boarding house locations as indicated on this map. This image indicates the possible locations for a new memorial plaque or plinth. The applicant noted that while the site meets most of the criteria, it has significant challenges, including lack of shade, an existing fire access lane, and conflicts with existing uses. These, these additional <clears throat> views of the site, and you can see the area's lack of shade and the Navy Memorial in the background. 
staff noted that it is unclear how a memorial honoring the diplomats of the Republic of Texas would relate to this established commemorative setting. The next two sites were split into the next site was split into two options, site F option one and two. Option one is on Indiana Avenue adjacent to the Argentine Naval Attaché. Option two is on the east side of Indiana Plaza adjacent to the National Council of Negro Women. Both options are located close to five of the original boarding houses, boarding house sites and meet most of the site evaluation criteria. Option one would be near the wide existing sidewalk on Indiana Avenue. This image indicates the possible locations of the memorial. The applicant stated that this site meets most of the evaluation criteria with good visibility and shade. The challenges for this site include the proximity to the Argentine Naval Attaché and the possibility of minor landscape improvements. Staff noted that these planter areas could be modified to accommodate a modest memorial without impacting pedestrian circulation. The site has good access and visibility and the existing shade will contribute to visitor comfort. In addition, the site is not immediately adjacent to an established commemorative work, offering greater design and content flexibility. Staff recommends the Commission suggest further development of a memorial at this location. Site F option two is an existing pedestrian plaza just east of the Grand Army of the Republic Memorial and between the Argentine Naval Attaché and the National Council of Negro Women. The applicant has evaluated the site option, and while the site has a peaceful shaded setting close to existing amenities, the location is already part of the African American Heritage Trail, and research, research indicates it was a possible location of a slave auction. These existing images of the site and site details indicate that while the site is suited for pedestrians with significant shade, staff finds it lacks visibility and the existing historic setting may create challenges for the insertion of a new memorial. In conclusion, all three sites meet eight of nine of the site evaluation criteria developed by the applicant, and each offers a variety of opportunities and challenges for commemoration. Staff recommends the Commission supports further development of a memorial at site F1. I am available to answer any questions that you have as well. Kitty Hoke from the Daughters of the Republic of Texas is also here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, fellow commissioners, do you have any questions? Hearing none, I will now open it up to the commission for discussion. I will start with Commissioner Argo and then go in a round robin format. Uh, please keep your webcams on. Commissioner Argo. Um, I don't have any particular questions at this time. Um, I uh, I think the, the one would they the, it's not a large memorial, but it but I think the presentation illustrates still how challenging it is to find the right place <laughs> for um, public access um, and without competing, I guess is what I'm trying to say with other um, either you know buildings, approaches, um, memorials that might be in the uh, in the area. but I um, I look forward to see how this is going to progress and appreciate the work that the staff is that the staff is doing on this. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Wright. Yeah, this is another one where I, I, I don't want to um, seem to insult the applicant. It's just that it's not it, it, it isn't. Yeah, I mean, I think the thematic connections are important, but the physical design of the memorial seems or um, I guess we're calling it a memorial. Yeah, and it is going to be so. Um, um, the um, God, what word can I use? Um, uh small <laughs> um that it won't i i just it i guess i'm just so used to wrestling with these much more complex and difficult things i have to say i'm really glad we looked at this though because when it first came up i i'm embarrassed and i shouldn't admit this but i will i didn't know what a legation was so i had to look it up and and it's super <laughs> interesting the history is really interesting. And so, you know, I, I bet you there are a lot of people who don't know what that is, what that's about. So 
um, it'll make an interesting read. But I thought the three sites that it comes down to, they all make sense. Um, you know, uh, again, it it's it's not it's it's very uncomplicated compared to the ones that we look at. So I imagine that it will resolve quite easily. Thank you, Commissioner Wright. Commissioner Dixon. Uh, thorough presentation, uh, and can't wait to find out what the results will be. Have no comments or questions. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Davenport, I think, had to step away. Uh, well, um, given that, let's go to Commissioner McMahon. No, thank you. Um, I have no comments or questions. Um, and, and like uh, Mina, it was interesting to find out about some of the history of uh, Texas and the location. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Trueblood. Uh, thanks again for the presentation. I guess the only point that I'll add, and I, I, I think you may have implied this, but I'll say it more explicitly, which is, and I'm trying to look at which site, is it E, E, site E near the um, Naval Memorial, just considering, you know, you talked about the context and how it relates. Um, I would also just consider the view shed, uh, which is pretty important, um, you know, from all the way from the portrait gallery down to the archives. So if insofar as it's any, if, if it's, you know, insofar, depending on what it is, uh, it could um, be something that has a more measurable impact on that. So just something to think about as you consider the sites. That's it. Thank you. And Commissioner May. Uh, yeah, I did want to uh, note one aspect of the, what was in the EDR, which refers to um, site F option two as uh, a, um, that it was at some point in its history, the location of a slave auction site in, that actually has not been determined. It was, it's, we know that it was somewhere in that area, but don't know exactly where. Um, but regardless, I think um, site uh, option F1 is, uh, seems to be slightly preferred by the, the in the EDR, and, and uh, that was consistent with the Commission of Fine Arts recommendation, and uh, we're certainly supportive of that. Um, the word that I would use to describe this, um, uh, Commissioner Wright, is modest. Um, it is far more modest than almost everything that we ever deal with when it comes to a memorial. Um, and it's a, it's a refreshing change, but it's also a little harder to deal with because we just don't deal with things that are this modest. Um, that being said, uh, I do think that this will be a very uh, simple process going forward, and I'm sure that no matter where it is placed, it will not pose view shed impacts of any substance. Um, it is the sort of thing that in another jurisdiction might easily be placed by the local historic society or something like that, as opposed to having to go through our process. But um, you know, we are tied to this because of the Commemorative Works Act, and uh, I would thank the Dogs of the Republic of Texas for their earnest efforts in going through all of this trouble um, to accomplish this objective. It's an awful lot of work uh, for this, again, very modest uh, uh, memorial. So thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner May. Um, I, I would also like to add, I appreciate the word modest about a very important story and the challenges that that presents in terms of how you tell the story and what um, really educating people about what a big effort that was to um, take an independent <laughs> Texas and make it part of the union. So um, Ms. Hoke, I bring you greetings from Texas and appreciation for your efforts in this regard. And um, it's very important to a lot of people and agree that going through this process for um, a modest memorial, I think is actually very helpful to elevate the story. and. There are some really interesting examples from uh, a competition we did a while back for how how do we tell these stories and make them compelling and help people understand what the experience of um, the folks who were here on behalf of the statehood of Texas uh, had, especially in a place that is so dense, um, dense in the richness of history and important events that took place in Washington, D.C. So um, thank you again for your, for your work on this project. So is there a, mo a motion to approve the comments on site selection? 
are, are so moved. Thank you, Commissioner May. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. It's been seconded by Commissioner Wright. Ms. Coster, can you please confirm the motion in the second and take the vote by roll call? Certainly. The motion was made by Commissioner May, the second by Commissioner Wright. And with that, Commissioner Trueblood. Yes. Uh, Commissioner May. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner McMahon. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Argo. Yes. Uh, Chair White. Yes. Commissioner Wright. Yes. Commissioner Dixon. Yes. Thank you. And I believe uh, as noted, Commissioner Davenport has stepped away. Thank you. The motion is carried. Next is agenda item 6D is for approval of comments on the draft master plan for the Wolf Trap National Park for the Performing Arts. And Ms. Free will be presenting today. Welcome, Ms. Free. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. OK, great. Well, good afternoon, Chair White and Commissioners. The National Park Service, in partnership with the Wolf Trap Foundation, has submitted a draft master plan for the Wolf Trap National Park for the Performing Arts, located in Fairfax County, Virginia, for the Commission's comments. The Commission last reviewed the concept master plan for this park in June of this year. As a reminder, the Wolf Trap National Park for the Performing Arts is a 130-acre park located on former farmland and uh, that's approximately 15 miles west of Washington, D.C. The park has direct access from the Dulles Access Road via Trap Road. And established in 1966, the park was envisioned as an opportunity to experience live performances, related educational programs, and associated recreation in a pastoral setting within the National Capital Area. The park contains three outdoor performance venues, the Filene Center, the Children's Theater in the Woods, and the Meadow Pavilion. There are also several other entertainment and facility support structures within the park, paved and turf parking areas, paved roads, managed turf areas, meadows, hiking trails, and approximately 65 acres of natural woodland, streams, and wetlands within the boundary of the park that are open and available for year-round use. As I mentioned, the Commission provided comments on the concept master plan in June. We are currently reviewing the draft master plan, and the final master plan is anticipated for review in February of 2022. NPS indicated that for the purposes of this review, the draft master plan and the draft environmental assessment or EA are the same document. The EA an anticipated finding of no significant impact will be completed prior to the final review in February. And at the draft master or draft master plan review stage, the commission should be focused on issues such as land use, transportation, and impacts to environmental and historic and cultural resources. And I will review these topics throughout this presentation. As a reminder, the park is the first and only national park dedicated to the performing arts. It was developed on land donated by Ms. Catherine Filene Schaus to the National Park Service in 1964, along with a generous monetary sum towards the construction of the Filene Center. The master plan seeks to continue Ms. Schaus's legacy, and overall staff supports the proposed draft master plan, which seeks to update and maintain the park in a manner that protects existing resources and retains the cultural landscape, outdoor recreation opportunities, and performing arts experiences in an outdoor setting. So before I review the com components of the draft master plan, I'll briefly provide an overview of the site's existing features. The park's existing site plan illustrates the concentration of performance venues in the southern and eastern half of the park. The majority of venue support services and park operations buildings are located between the Filene Center and an area referred to as Gills Hill. The north and west portions of the site are primarily, primarily used for grass and paved parking areas. Main Circle Road, Barn Road, and Stage Road are the primary connections between the performance spaces and parking areas. Main Circle Road forms a loop at the main gate with buyer retention in the center. 
This area is casually referred to as the dimple for its depressed form. The key features of the park addressed in the master plan include the main gate, food service stand A, and the south gate service stand, the east meadow, the northern approach, the children's theater in the woods, the east and west parking lots, parking near the main gate, and pedestrian circulation and safety throughout the park. Staff has analyzed the draft master plan using guidance from the comprehensive plan from the National Capitol, particularly policies related to the federal transportation, environment, parks and open space, and preservation and historic features elements. In addition, staff finds improvements identified in the draft master plan are consistent with those presented in the concept master plan. Staff also finds the updates to the master plan are responsive to the Commission's comments on the concept, which addressed transportation, pedestrian circulation, the main circle road options, sustainability, historic and cultural resources, and additional coordination and implementation. Additional refinements to the draft are also the result of advancing the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, and the National Historic Preservation Act, Section 106 processes. For example, a cultural landscape report was completed by the NPS, and the National Register of Historic Places nomination is currently in progress. Both documents identify and assess significant cultural and historic resources associated with the site. I'll now review the primary components of the draft master plan. The improvements in the draft are categorized into five different areas within the park. These areas and improvements include the core farm, the Filene Center, the main circle, the West Park, and the East Park. So within the core farm, the plan proposes to widen primary pedestrian pathways, add overhead non-contiguous walkway treatments for queuing patrons on Gills Road, construct a new pedestrian tunnel at the intersection of Main Circle Road and Barn Road, install information kiosks in accessible picnic areas, and rehabilitate the associates building and cabin. In addition, a comprehensive signage and wayfinding system would be developed as a task under the master plan to inform and direct visitors and patrons within the core farm and throughout the rest of the park. At the Filene Center, seating would be reconfigured to better facilitate accessibility, food service stand A, and the Southgate service stand would be removed and replaced with improved concessions, restrooms, security, gathering spaces and elevators to provide access between the upper and lower levels of the venue. At the main circle, a bypass lane would be added for better access to lots one and four, which are near the Filene Center. The main gate canopy and plaza would be extended and enhanced with uh, better security equipment and standoff distances. Overhead non-contiguous walkway treatments would be added for queuing patrons as well on Main Circle Road. The existing parking around the circle would be removed. The bioretention area in the center of the loop would be reduced and the Metro shuttle stop would, would remain. The stop currently connects to the West Falls Church Station and the foundation would continue to coordinate with Fairfax County to provide a potential shuttle connection to the Spring, Spring Hills Silver Line Station. Within the West Park, the draft master plan proposes stream bank stabilization to retrofit the east and west parking lots with stormwater management improvements <clears throat> such as permeable paving and vegetated planting strips and to formalize a pickup and drop off area for rideshare services. And in the East Park, <clears throat> eroded trails would be realigned and new accessible trails would be constructed. Bridge replacement over Wolf Trap Creek is also proposed. A new kiosk and restrooms would be constructed near the Meadow Pavilion. And if determined to be necessary in the future, the Meadow Pavilion would be constructed outside of the 100 year floodplain. A few, a few minor improvements within the 100 year floodplain include a children's theater in the woods pavilion or kiosk and a new restroom near the children's theater. Since the Biden administration recently reinstated Executive Order 13690, 
which revises the elevation and flood hazard area based on the 500 year floodplain for both critical and non critical development actions. Staff requests a summary of how improvements within the 100 year floodplain would, co would comply with this executive order. You may recall that the concept master plan included three options for the configuration of Main Circle Road. The Commission supported option C during concept review. <clears throat> option C reduced the bioretention area in the middle of the circle about, by about 33% and proposes new surface parking with accessible spaces to the south of the circle. Staff notes the applicant selected option C as the preferred alternative for mitigating for configuration of new accessible parking spaces near the main gate and the Filene Center. While other alternatives were considered in the concept master plan, staff also finds the location of the proposed accessible parking in this option best accommodates disabled patrons while preserving the view of the Filene Center approach, which is a character defining feature of the park. Staff notes the preferred alternative will require the removal of 41 trees and additional trees may be removed with the replacement of stands A and stand B. However, the draft master plans approach to tree replacement is consistent with the comprehensive plans, tree preservation and replacement policies and replacement trees will be planted on site in the east and west parking lots. In addition, Stormwater management facilities would be installed in the new parking lot and could include bioretention areas, permeable paving, or other low impact development techniques to offset the reduction in the area of bioretention in the, in, within the main loop. And staff also notes that the draft master plan <clears throat> includes an approach for incorporating stormwater management, renewable energy, and other sustainability objectives. Potential strategies for exploration include the use of renewable energy resources sources such as solar panels, green roofs, and the use of sustainable or recycled materials. Staff notes that NPS nominated the park as a historic district in the National Register of Historic Places, and the character defining contributing resources are identified in the park's cultural landscape report. These include spatial organization, circulation, views, and buildings and structures. In addition, an, <clears throat> an assessment of effects, which includes archaeological resources, has been prepared for the project and will be reviewed by the Virginia Department of Historic Resources and Tribal Historic Preservation Office. NPS and the Foundation have conducted two consulting parties meetings to determine potential adverse effects and identify ways to avoid, mitigate, or minimize these effects. So at this time, NPS has to has determined a finding of adverse effect. And as a result, staff notes the applicant will prepare a programmatic agreement to mitigate these effects on the, of the draft master plan on the parks contributing historic resources. Individual 106 consultations will occur during implementation of each project in the master plan. And with regard to implementation, NPS and the foundation anticipate the implementation of the plan to occur over the course of 20 years. This is divided into the near term, mid term and long term. The stand A replacement and new accessible picnic areas would be implemented first, and the majority of remaining projects are anticipated in the mid term or within four to seven years following the plan's approval. An NPS has conducted extensive outreach with state and local agencies as well as the public. While coordination is ongoing, NPS distributed the plan to all interested parties, hosted two Section 106 meetings, and currently has the plan listed for public comment on its Pepsi website until the end of this month. In addition, NCPC staff referred the draft master plan to the applicable state and local agencies for review and comment. Therefore, staff notes the applicant initiated coordination early on with Fairfax County, and the interjurisdictional re referral process is currently in progress and comments received will be addressed in the final master plan. And as I have incorporated the recommendations into my presentation, I'm not going to repeat them here just for the interest of time. And that concludes my presentation. Uh, we have here with us Arvind Manocha with the Wolf Trap Foundation who would like to say a few words 
followed by Ken Bigley, the acting superintendent for the park. Thank you. Thank you very much to the commissioners and to the staff of the commission for this opportunity. Uh, the work that you saw described uh, so wonderfully a few minutes ago is really the result of a multi-year joint effort between the National Park Foundation and the, sorry, the Wolf Trap Foundation for the uh, Performing Arts and the National Park Service to examine the potential improvements as we embark upon our second 50 years. We recognize that the needs of patrons and artists at all performing arts venues and spaces throughout our country continue uh, to evolve. It's a very dynamic scenario. And our goal throughout has been to make sure that Wolf Trap remains in the very top tier of similar venues, both locally and with its national peers of places like Tanglewood, the Saratoga Performing Arts Center, Ravinia, the Mann Center, and the Hollywood Bowl, all of whom have made major investments in their facilities within the last decade. We recognize that there's an opportunity presented by the philanthropic community of this region who are energized to help the Park Service make long discussed improvements. And we recognize that there are significant opportunities to improve safety and security, which has become an increasingly uh, important topic within the live concert business over the last decade, to increase accessibility for those with mobility needs, to offer greater amenities to visitors and artists, to address a number of deferred maintenance issues and to increase visitorship to the National Park year round. All the while, we strive to retain the very best of Wolf Trap, ensuring the seamless marriage of nature and art, and to carry forward the architectural and philanthropic legacy of our original donor, Catherine Schaus. Thank you very much. And good afternoon, commissioners and, and staff members of the commission. My name is Ken Bigley. I am the acting superintendent for Wolf Trap National Park for the Performing Arts. Wolf Trap is very unique among the 423 units of the national park system because we are the only national park set aside specifically for the presentation of performing arts. Um, as Arvin related, we operate the park through a partnership and we are united with the foundation in not only providing a world-class experience on the stage, but also an emphasis on education and making sure that the performing arts are affordable to a wide cross-section of society, as well as uh, providing a diverse array of programming on the stage. Um, also, as Arvind related, we, um, we are proud to present a product, a theatrical product that is world-class, but sometimes the visitor experience fall short of that standard because of some of the deficiencies of the site and the fact that the needs of artists and the public have evolved over the 50 years that that wolf trap has been around um, and i want to really highlight the fact that this master this draft master plan has the potential to truly revolutionize the wolf trap experience the amenities such as the upgrading of restroom facilities universal accessibility for the first time for all park visitors elements like parking and pedestrian safety. Um, collectively, these will provide a vastly improved park experience for, uh, for all of our park visitors. And through this, um, it will help to ensure that Wolf Trap remains relevant, um, not only in the coming years, but also able to continue to carry out that mission of, of making the arts accessible and affordable to a, to a broad section of our community. And I think the beauty of the master plan is that it accomplishes that while still maintaining the pastoral setting and many of the values that make people come to Wolf Trap in the first place. Uh, so we're very grateful to the commission and the staff for taking the time to review this, and we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. Well, thank you so much, Superintendent Bigley, Mr. Minocha, Ms. Free. Um, very helpful to have you here today and uh, understand the context for the work that you're carrying out there. It's very helpful. So uh, do the commissioners have any questions? Hearing no questions, I will now open it up to the commission for discussion, starting with Commissioner Wright and then go in round robin format as we have throughout the meeting. Um, Commissioner Wright. You know, I was 
hoping that you weren't going to start with me um, <laughs> because, because I actually don't have much to say. I remember looking at the, when did we see this last? It's been that's a, a question. It was in June, June of yeah, this year. That's what I thought. It hasn't been a, it hasn't been a long time. Um, it, uh, I don't have much to say because I think it's pretty good um, and, and, and responsive and to the comments we did make. Um, um, and gosh, it, to be truthful, it's been a long time since I've been to Wolf Trap. So it was, it was kind of nice to have a look at it. I'll totally cop to having studied it more thoroughly in June. I looked at it and I thought, oh, well, you know, it looks pretty similar to what we saw in June. So I gave it a little bit of short shrift, to be honest, because um, I think it's pretty good. And it and it did you did everything you were asked to do. So that's unusual. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Dixon. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Can't wait to take advantage of the improvements and see them go forward. Thank you, Commissioner McMahon. Yes, thank you. I uh, appreciate seeing the follow up since June. Uh, looks good. I have no questions. Thanks. Commissioner Trueblood. Yes, they have us all. Uh, we spoke <laughs> to all of our questions, so it looks good to me. It uh, looks, you know, the respect was res um, good. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner May. Oh, good. So, Everybody, nobody had anything to say, so I get to talk more. <laughs> sure. Okay. No. Uh. And and actually, I don't have much to say. Well, you don't I, have to. I know. Uh, <laughs> I'm, very, I'm very familiar with the uh, the plan. Um. I do want to say a couple things. I want to thank the NCPC staff for all of their work and their flexibility as we've gone through a pretty rapid but complicated master plan project with some simultaneous uh, simultaneous projects from within it um, it's it's we really do appreciate your working with us to achieve this um, because we want to make these improvements and um, you know it's a clear path to do it and it, it could have gotten more complicated but it was uh, it was complicated enough as it was and again we appreciate the flexibility and all the effort on the part uh, part of the staff um, I do want to thank the Wolf Trump Foundation for all of their work um, in effort and funding to develop the plan and to help the Park Service with so many long needed improvements and to really modernize the uh, uh, modernize <clears throat> the facilities at Wolf Trap. Uh, we too look forward to the next 15 years. Um, and uh, and I also want to thank my staff who have worked very hard uh, to move this along quickly because it was uh, it was a, it, it's a been a challenging thing. Um, uh, and we have a we have a lot going on at the moment, um, but we we thank everybody working with us. And uh, again, it's it's good all around. Um, I do want to make one minor clarification, which is that um, this is a draft master plan and an EA. It's not a draft EA. We don't do draft EA EAs. I don't want to have it, anybody have the impression that we're going to do a a subsequent version of the EA. I mean, this is the EA. Um, there will be a final version of the master plan, which will be very similar to what we've already seen, and that will come back to the commission for a final approval uh, very quickly. Um, but we're going through the EA process, and we'll be making a decision on that once the comment period closes. So um, I think that's it. Thank you very much. And thank you, Commissioner May, and for that clarification. Uh, Commissioner Argo. I want to echo uh, the comments I've already heard. I have, um, so it's close to my heart in the sense that, you know, we've got uh, performance artists in our family. And um, I think the, you know, the whole nature of performance art and then accommodating that to um, this, to a park setting and having all that come together in a master plan um, is a challenge uh, to say the least. It, um, I, I don't have any other particular comments about it. And in this um, in this beautiful setting, they've done. I think they've done a great job. Certainly, if 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 Peter Peter doesn't have any 
um, substantial comments. I'm not um, I'm not sure any of the rest of us are even um, qualified to make them. <laughs> but uh, I look forward to the. Um, uh, I also appreciate the comment about staying um, uh, staying close to the vision of the uh, of the original founder. Um, it's you know that that this park is special in so many ways, and that's another one of um, one of the things that makes it unique. Um, appreciate the. I just I really look forward to this as it as it moves forward. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Argo. I really appreciate your perspective on this, and reminding us that a national park devoted to the performing arts is an extraordinary thing and a very special place. Um, as you said, any park to accommodate performing arts, much less a, a national park of this importance. So congratulations to everyone for the for the great work in bringing this forward and balancing a whole lot of needs um, in, a in a space that's very, um, very special. So thank you. So with that, is there a motion to approve the comments on the draft master plan? Motion. It feels like very, sorry, who made the motion? Colin. Thank you, Commissioner Davenport. Um, is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Commissioner May. Um, seconded the motion. Ms. Coster, can you please confirm the motion and the second and take the vote by roll call? Certainly. Uh, uh, Commissioner Davenport made the motion. Commissioner May provided the second. And with that, Commissioner Trueblood? Yes. Uh, Commissioner May? Yes. Commissioner McMahon? Yes. Commissioner Argo? Yes. Chair White? Yes. Commissioner Wright? Yes. Commissioner Dixon? Yes. And Commissioner Davenport? Yes. So thank you. The motion is carried. And uh, thank you, Commissioner Davenport. I looked down for a second. I didn't realize you had come back. So thank you for making the effort to rejoin us. I know this, this is a very busy day for you. Well, this so project's we really important to us and is also part of my immersive uh, participation in this uh, commission is uh, the uh, Wolf Trap has had many members of our staff and me out to, to view this project. Well, thank you very much. Um, we really appreciate it. And with that, this concludes our open session agenda. The commission will meet again Thursday, January 6, 2022 at 1 p.m. I see uh, Commissioner May would like to make a remark before we conclude. If I could, Madam Chairman, I just want to congratulate you on the successful completion of your first meeting as the official <laughs> uh, chairperson. Here, uh, here. And uh, your your years of experience in the commission have already shown through. It's almost as if you have experience sharing these meetings from before. You know. <laughs> anyway, I've, thank I've, you very much. Not not just for all of your time, but you know, stepping in for that period where we were without a chair. Um, so really appreciate that. I'm glad that your work has been recognized. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And uh, the experience helped for today. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, Commissioner Trueblood, I'm glad you turned on your camera once again. Thank you um, as your final meeting with us. Of course, great contributions as always. And as I said, we wish you well and we won't let you get far. Thank we'll you we'll miss you. We'll miss you, Andrew. Thanks. Absolutely. And congratulations on your marriage. Oh that my goodness, important. that's that right. Thank you. you got married. Commissioner Trueblood, okay. yeah, big, uh, lots of changes in your world. So congratulations. Put them all together. Congratulations. Dude. That's how well, I want to extend my warm wishes to everyone for the holiday season and um, all the best in the new year. We will see each other again soon. And thank you, Commissioner Dixon, for taking on the vice chair role and continuing your leadership um, of the organization. So we really appreciate it. And to the staff, thank you again. This has been happy quite a year. Right. Sorry. I said happy holidays, everyone. And uh, thank you all for putting me, giving me this new role. <laughs> well, 
Uh, thank you and and to the staff amazing work as always this has been a challenging year for everyone um, with covid and working remotely but you guys make it seamless and we really appreciate your devotion to great work so thank you everyone if there's no further business the open session is now adjourned bye happy holidays thank you happy holidays bye -bye. thank you